Okay. I feel like uh, I have the easiest job of everyone. I'm Zib Carell with Kent Street Coalition. Welcome back tonight. I recognize many, many faces here, which is wonderful. Um, we're going to be talking about the budget and have two people with a lot of experience around that um, sharing with us. Uh, Mary Jane Walner, who happens to be my rep in Ward 5, and she also covers Hopkinton, and Phil Slutton from the Fiscal Policy Institute. So it's up to you folks to decide who goes first. Um, we will be accepting questions in the chat and uh, I'll screen through those a bit and um, offer them up to you guys when you're all done with your comments. And um, we want to finish up before seven o'clock. So it's over to both of you. All right, great. And we had planned that I would, uh, I would go first. So I'll, if it's all right with everyone, I will share my screen and uh, hopefully you will be able to see the slide deck. Can everybody see it? Mm -hmm. All right, great, excellent. So again, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Um, again, my name is Phil Sletton. I'm a senior policy analyst at the New Hampshire Fiscal Policy Institute. NHFPI is an uh, independent, nonprofit, nonpartisan policy research organization based in Concord. We study the uh, state uh, budget and revenue policy, as well as the state economy, and uh, some healthcare policy as well, with an eye towards how these areas affect people with low and moderate incomes uh, in New Hampshire. Now, uh, I have a fair bit of content here, and this is a complex subject, so I do want to say right up front that the slides will be available online later. I can send around the link once they are posted, and I'll be putting them up on the website tomorrow. And uh, I also really want to give you a flavor for a lot of these things. There's, again, a fair bit of complexity here uh, that's layered in, um, but I want to at least expose you to some of these concepts around what does our state budget look like and what is in it and what has some of the recent history been and what, does the, uh, what, does, uh, what do things look like currently when we're talking about uh, the impacts of the COVID-19 crisis, particularly on state revenue. So first, and I know this will be review for a lot of you and maybe everyone on the call, but what, are, what is the state budget? How, you know, what time does it cover? What are the basics? How large is it? So first, it's a two-year state budget or a biennial state budget. When we're talking about the state budget, we're generally talking about the state operating budget that covers two state fiscal years. And state fiscal years are July 1st to June 30th years. So we're about two months into the second year of the current state budget, which is about uh, $13 billion in appropriations to fund most state operations during that two-year period. It's actually comprised, when we're talking about the state budget, we're generally talking about two separate pieces of legislation. The first is the operating budget bill, or uh, typically House Bill 1 or HB 1, although it doesn't have to be, but it's introduced that way typically. Um, and it is mostly what you would look like a budget to expect to look like. There's line item appropriations where there's an item and a dollar amount next to it. That's most of it. There, are, there is some text as well, both footnotes and, um, uh, and additional sections at the end that are more text-based, but most of the text associated with what we typically call the state budget is actually in the second piece of legislation, which is called the trailer bill, um, or House Bill 2 or HB 2. It's a companion bill, an omnibus bill that covers lots of topics that actually includes the policy changes and the policy language that in many cases will uh, describe new programs that will be set up and perhaps funded in House Bill 1. Um, it can also have separate appropriations for those programs in itself. So oftentimes the two are interrelated and uh, lean on each other, if you will, in some ways um, to, to enable both to work. And they move through the process together. Now, I do want to note that not all state expenditures are in the state budget. There are some fairly significant expenditures that aren't in the biennial state budget, including the uh, expenditures that are in the capital budget, which covers a six-year period and has changes every two years, and actually can, um, can also permit bonding and borrowing money to fund capital projects, which borrowing money to fund the state operating budget cannot be done in the state operating budget's plan. Um, and also the 10-year transportation improvement plan is a, is a, uh, a somewhat similar uh, bill that's a separate piece of legislation outside the state budget that looks at 10 years of construction projects um, around uh, transportation construction projects. And also there are bills that have separate appropriations in them and a separate expenditure authority that, uh, that are included in them. 
uh, probably the uh, most significant example of this in terms of expenditures uh, is expanded Medicaid in the state, the Granted Advantage Program, as it's currently called in New Hampshire. Uh, that is established in a separate piece of legislation that's not included in the state budget, although the essentially the rest of the Medicaid program is um, uh, funded through the state budget. That portion of the Medicaid program is not. So when we're talking about what the state budget spends money on, uh, this is a really 30,000 foot view of what are the different general areas in which there are state budget expenditures. And uh, these are six broad categories uh, that all expenditures in the state operating budget are broken down into. Uh, and you can see that some of them are pretty self-explanatory. So for example, transportation is mostly the, it's essentially the Department of Transportation budget in, is that 11% slice that you can see in the pie. Um, there are others, you know, general government includes things like the Department of Administrative Services, Department of Treasury. So there's the, the titles give you some sense of what's in them. I do want to point to the uh, largest few slices here. Education uh, includes not only the Department of Education and the grants that go to local governments to fund local public education from the state or to help fund local public education from the state, but also includes uh, funding for the uh, community college system and the university system that comes from the state. Of the portion that comes from the state, as well as uh, as well as a couple other entities, and health and social services that 43% slice in orange, uh, that is uh, primarily the Department of Health and Human Services budget. There's a pretty small portion that is else uh, that is otherwise, but that's a very you know it's our largest state agency provides a lot of services to a lot of people, and uh, you can see that that's a very significant portion of the budget. So what does that that look like over time? So this is that health and social services portion of the budget, which again, very closely mirrors the Department of Health and Human Services budget. Over the last you know, 15 years or so, uh, 15 state fiscal years, and, uh, and you can see that this is in nominal dollars. These are not adjusted for inflation. So you would expect it to go up as the value, as how much uh, health and social services a dollar can buy uh, goes down over time. And one of the things that you can see here, and this is a pattern I want you to, I want you to watch for, because we'll, we'll talk about you know, referring to the last recession in a couple different instances here. Um, you can see that there was, there was an increase and then a drop off. And during the 2008-2009 budget, that, those two state fiscal years really encompassed the Great Recession, the last recession that we were in, not this one, but, the, but prior to this long economic expansion that we had. And then the 2010-2011 budget is the immediately in the recovery period. And that included, for example, federal relief funds, uh, federal funds that some of which were able to be incorporated into the state budget. So uh, that's, that's why you see some changes there, as well as you know, changes of policymaker decisions around what changes, what priorities uh, were there for that budget cycle. And then, you, then the 2012-2013 budget, some of the federal funds that were there in the prior budget were no longer there. It was a different set of policymakers, largely making a different set of decisions. And you could see that there was a decrease in the health and social services budget. That was a pretty significant amount. And actually, we didn't get back to that, the state didn't get back to that 2011 uh, uh, budget amount, nominal budgeted amount, again, unadjusted for inflation, until you got to roughly 2016 and 2017 into that budget cycle. Um, and of course, we've seen increases more recently, in part in response to a substance use disorder uh, crisis in the state, as well as um, concerns around the mental health infrastructure. Um, so those, and those are, for example, services that fall under uh, health and social services, the health and social services category. Education is another, you know, it's the next largest slice of the pie, if you will. Uh, and you can see here that this is, again, unadjusted for inflation, a somewhat different shape. That's a relatively steady amount of dollars, except for some noteworthy changes. One is, again, we have this change from 2011 to 2012. Part of that is around how the budgeting was uh, completed for the community college system and the university system. There were some changes at the community college system budgeting uh, for a time, but as well as significantly the amount of funding that was uh, devoted from the state to the university system and the community college system, and particularly on the university system side, there was a significant reduction. And uh, one thing I will note as well is that there was a change, there were changes to the, uh, the formula for funding local public education uh, during this time period as well. One of the reasons that we do see it to be relatively static over time here is that the, uh, a lot of the funding for local public education is determined on a per pupil basis. And the number of pupils that we've seen in New Hampshire school districts has been declining over this time period that we see here. 
So that uh, that is the dynamic that affects how how much funding is uh, is goes from the state to local governments. Of course, the most recent budget we've also seen some changes that have uh, gotten the appropriations amount back to where they were roughly prior to the recession and in those budgets that were supported in part by federal funds during the recession. And then transportation funding, we see a relatively steady picture again until some of the most recent uh, funding changes. Um, there was an increase in the motor fuels tax uh, rate um, uh, around 2015, 2016, and you can see some of that effect here, um, as well as there were other appropriations outside the state budget um, that, were, uh, that were then in part you know, considered in the 2020, 2021, the current budget as well. So when we're talking about uh, the state budget, that's, that's roughly what the categories are in terms of the expenditure categories, but how is it actually organized in terms of how it's set up? And this is important because it helps you understand how different sources of funding in, uh, can be used. Uh, so the uh, state budget is broken up into funds, and think of funds as sort of like accounts, money comes in from various sources and goes out for various purposes. And the largest slice of the pie here, as you can see, is federal funds. These are transfers from the federal government to pay for certain programs, whether, for example, it's Medicaid is a very significant one, uh, food assistance, um, uh, the, uh, some highway funds, some funds for highway improvements, for example, uh, are transferred from the federal government to the state government over time. So the federal funds portion is very significant, about 30% of the state budget. Think of it as roughly one in three dollars that the state uses for operations come from federal transfers. And I'll say, it's also often a question, is that atypical? No, New Hampshire is relatively typical, um, actually a little bit under where most, uh, where many states are. Um, so it's, uh, it's, this is not an atypical amount in terms of the importance of federal funds in the state budget. The next slice that I wanna point your attention to is the general fund portion, which is about a quarter of the state budget. And most of the debates that, uh, uh, over how to use state budget funds that you may have read about in the newspaper, for example, uh, are around general fund dollars. Certainly not all of them, but general fund dollars are those with, with that policymakers have the most flexibility over in terms of how to direct them. Uh, a lot of the funding sources for the general fund are uh, their state tax sources or other state generated revenue sources. So there's a lot of flexibility at the state level, um, which there is not always with federal funds. They often have requirements attached to them. And I've intentionally put the Education Trust Fund, the orange slice, next to the general fund, because those two funds do interact. If the Education Trust Fund has a shortfall, the general fund will fill that shortfall. And the two funds uh, always uh, also share a lot of the same revenue sources, so they're often analyzed together because of those relationships. Now there are other funds that you, you, know, you should be generally aware of as highway fund, the turnpike funds, and those are sort of separate entities with their own sorts of restrictions on them. There are many, many other smaller funds that uh, contribute to the state budget, but this is the overall picture at again about 30,000 feet. So thinking about what was in that green slice and the orange slice, the general fund and the education trust fund, this is the, the picture of the revenue streams for those two funds put together. Um, and a lot of these revenue sources are shared. Some of them just go to one or just go to the other, but many of them are shared, including some of the largest ones. And basically, and there's a lot of detail here, but basically I, I want you to note that it is a relatively diverse revenue picture. There, there are only four revenue sources on here that are more than 10% of, of the pie. That's not to say that the tobacco tax and the real estate transfer tax and liquor and lottery revenues are not important. There are, those are significant sources of funding for uh, the state budget. Um, but if we're talking about the largest pieces, there's not, there's not one dominant piece, if you will. Um, the business taxes, you can see the business profits tax and the business enterprise tax, I have shaded them together. That's because they're filed together typically, they are often analyzed together. They're actually rather different taxes, but because they are collected often at the same time and actually aren't parsed out for some period of time afterwards, uh, they are often analyzed and projected together. Uh, the statewide education property tax is uh, is not a ta it's not a typical tax in that the state doesn't collect money from it. Actually, it is a it is a required levy, but the it is raised and retained locally. So uh, no dollars. It, it does show up on the state books, but there aren't any dollars, if you will, that 
go from where the dollars are raised to the state coffers to be deployed for other things. It is a very specific purpose tax. And we can talk about that more if there are, if there are questions about that. Um, that's uh, as, it's a, as it's set up now, it is a state tax, but it does not collect money in some of the other same ways that these other tax revenue sources do. For example, the meals and rentals tax uh, is the second largest tax that the state actually collects uh, revenue from, for example, even though the, uh, on the books, it appears a little bit smaller than the statewide education property tax because the, the latter just offsets a liability, if you will. Now, the largest state tax, uh, the largest tax re single tax revenue source the state has is the business profits tax. I wanna talk a little bit about that uh, in terms of a few notes about it. Um, one is uh, if you see these two pie charts, you'll see that the one on the left shows the percentage of filers or the types of filers uh, that are within, or the percentage of all filers that are within each type. Um, so you'll see here that proprietors are about four in 10, corporations are about a third, partnerships are about uh, one in five. Um, about 5% 5 are what's called water's edge entities, which tend to be, you know, speaking broadly, multi-part entities that, uh, that are across state and uh, often national borders have significant components overseas. They account for about 5% of filers. However, if we're looking at the amount of revenue collected from by filer type, which you can see on the pie chart on the right, those water's edge entities account for more than half of the revenue collected by the business profits tax. Um, so similarly, uh, potentially similarly, I'll note that um, if you look at tax year 2017, there were about 56 uh, businesses with a more than, that owed one, more than $1 million in tax liabilities. Those 56 businesses paid about 41.5% of all business profits tax receipts. And if you expand it out to those businesses that owed more than $100,000 in business profits tax, they accounted for nearly three out of every $4 collected by this tax. So that's all to say that there's uh, the, the lar large or typically large, but definitely high profit entities are uh, make up a lion's the lion's share of the majority of the business profits tax base. That's not to say that it doesn't affect smaller businesses per se, but that's something you should know because there's often discussions around uh, around business tax rates as part of a state budget discussion, or that has been in recent years. So if we look at general education trust fund revenue over time, uh, this this is inflation adjusted, and it gives you a sense of what has changed in general and education trust fund revenue in terms of um, actual, uh, you know, actual resources available. Uh, and this does not uh, adjust for some of the policy changes that were incorporated during, uh, over this time period. Uh, and you'll see that 2020 is shaded in because that's a, that's a preliminary number. Uh, but uh, you'll see that it's a relatively steady amount, but uh, prior to the recession, it was a somewhat higher amount in terms of real dollars, in terms of inflation adjusted dollars. If we zoom in a little bit more and look month to month, that allows us to see some of the trends. Th these are 12 month rolling averages. That thick green line shows total general and education trust fund revenue uh, on a 12 month rolling average, each, you know, what's the monthly average relative to the prior year. And one of the things I do wanna point out, there are some changes during this time period in terms of, in terms of how much revenue is coming in. Um, this uh, piece, the thick green line is separated from the other two because the thick green line includes the, the two primary business taxes. The other two lines do not. Um, they, are, uh, they are a smaller subset of general and education trust fund revenue. You can see there was a decline here. Some of that was, ex or there was a decline here, I should say. Some of that was expected because of uh, fewer one-time revenues coming in. And we can talk more about why there were one-time revenues if people are curious. But really this drop-off that we've seen in the most recent months uh, that is driven in large part by the COVID-19 crisis and its effect on state revenues, particularly the business taxes and also the meals and rentals tax, which as a, a, is a 90% tax that's 80% uh, roughly of the tax base is restaurant meals, and then is also levied against hotel rooms and rental cars. So this is one tax revenue source that, as you can see on the graph, is you know, underperforming where it was uh, in prior in, in the last year. Um, depending on which month you're looking at, you know, in these most recent months, between 30 and 50 percent, um, and we'll see, we'll have to see how much it rebounds. But again, it's a significant tax revenue source. You look at the business taxes in a little more detail. You can see the rolling, uh, the 12-month average is the thicker green line, and the more responsive uh, quarterly average relative to the prior year is in blue. 
you can see there was a reduction, uh, you know, following some of the one-time revenues that uh, came in in fiscal 2019 that then went away, uh, 2018 and 2019 that then went away. And there's only been a further reduction since then. Um, so we were at a reduced amount uh, it, it immediately in the prior year, and we've seen another reduction uh, in subsequent, you know, subsequent time period. So that's, that gives you a sense of, you know, where, what sort of revenue impact we've seen uh, recently here and what we might be seeing going forward a little bit. You'll see that, you know, the July number on this graph is actually a little bit more optimistic, but there's some timing changes there in terms of when taxes were filed that affected that. So what does the budget shortfall look like then? Each state budget has a revenue plan for the next two years, for that two year period. And revenues come in obviously somewhere around that plan. Uh, and, and what does that then look like? This is a graph showing 2007 to 2021, or 2020, I should say. What were the preliminary numbers coming out of each fiscal year relative to the state budget plan? So you can see there are vertical lines that shows you where each different state budget was. And during the Great Recession, which was 2008, 2009 on this graph, those state fiscal years, you can see there was a pretty significant drop, especially in 2009, which was sort of entirely encompassed by the most acute part of the Great Recession. Um, if you go to 2020, you can see that the shortfall was actually was a fair bit less than that shortfall that we saw in the 2009 uh, budget relative to the original budget plan. Um, however, uh, the COVID-19 crisis only really started impacting state revenues in the last quarter of 2020 which means that the projections that the state agencies have put forward um, in the most recent ones in July um, that they put forward in state fiscal year 20, for state fiscal year 2021 suggest that there's gonna be a larger shortfall. And again, when we're talking about a shortfall, we're talking about a two-year budget shortfall in the general education trust funds, and there are shortfalls in the highway funds and the turnpike funds as well. So we're looking at about uh, you know, a little under $400 million if you were to take these two projections together. Um, and, or, or pardon me, what we know now from fiscal 2020 with the unaudited figures and the projection that we have. Now, that slightly less than $400 million shortfall can be offset fund some by the rainy day fund, which has about $115 million in it, but obviously that's not offsetting the whole difference. So then you can see the question mark I put on this graph for what happens with federal aid, and you might be saying, of course, we've received a fair bit of federal aid. We were even discussing it a little bit prior to this presentation beginning. Um, so how is that helping us? Well, unfortunately, the most of the federal aid that we've received, not all of it, but most of it, cannot be used to offset state or local revenue losses. The most flexible portion, uh, which Representative Walner actually re referred to um, a little bit at the, at the beginning of this call, um, uh, the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security or CARES Act coronavirus relief funds. There's uh, one and a quarter billion dollars of those that came to New Hampshire. Um, those have to be deployed by uh, December 30th of this year, and they cannot be used to offset previously budgeted expenditures at the state or local level. So there are, there are some portions that can help, but that significant portion cannot be used to help under current uh, federal guidelines. So uh, then the question is, if there's additional federal aid, what form does it come in? First, does it come in? Second, what form does it come in? So it may be that there's more flexibility for those CARES Act coronavirus relief funds. Uh, there could be an increased federal Medicaid match. Uh, there is a somewhat increase, there's a small increase now or uh, important but uh, increase now, but that's not actually gonna offset previously budgeted costs. So there could be a larger increase that comes and provides aid. There could be direct aid for school districts that offsets previously budgeted expenditures as well. Um, there could also be direct unrestricted aid to states and that would allow the state to deploy it to um, a backfill of budget shortfall. Um, there's also a question of timing. The budget shortfall is growing some over time. So, uh, so when does this aid arrive if there is aid coming? And this is also local governments. Uh, local government assistance um, you know, it may be part of the picture and uh, there is an interaction, a strong fiscal interaction between the state and local governments. So, you know, and when we're thinking about how revenue is raised in New Hampshire and revenue sources for public services in New Hampshire. Um, the tax revenue sources that you see at the state level, and you can see those on this graph here, um, are significant. And you know, the business profits and business enterprise taxes, for example, are uh, you saw that how important they are in the slice of the pie relative to property taxes that are levied locally, including local property taxes. 
that you know those are relatively uh, those are those, the local property tax is a significant revenue raiser and you know pays for a significant number of services at the local level. Um, so how those property tax receipts come in is another part of the fiscal picture here. So I've run a little bit over, but I want to refer you to some uh, other resources. Um, building the budget is, uh, walks you through the uh, state budget process in New Hampshire. Revenue and review helps explain uh, the uh, way the state government raises revenue in New Hampshire. Uh, and then we do have an issue brief for the current state budget, as well as a state budget resource page, a uh, COVID-19 resource page, and a common sense blog that is relatively frequently updated. So thank you very much. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Representative Walner so uh, she can provide you with her insights. Thank you, Phil, that was great. Um, Phil, did, Phil did actually all, all, the hard, all the hard work, I think. Um, and I think the slides are really, are really helpful. Um, so what I want, wanted to talk a little bit about to start with um, something that I thought maybe people from Kent Street might be interested in is sort of what how how does the budget get built and it the um, phases that we go through to build the budget the first phase is happening right now and uh, right now all the agencies are actually working on their projected budget for um, the 22-23 biennium. And as an advocate, if there is a particular um, program or something that you're particularly interested in, I think that trying to reach out to the agencies as they're putting their budgets together is probably a really good place to start. Um, mainly because if you can get them to include it in their budget, it's much easier if you have the agencies including these things in their budget than trying to come to the legislature six months later and try to convince the legislature to add to the budget that's been presented. So we're in that agency um, phase right now. And um, the agency phase started in March, but that's really, they're really in the, they're really working on it right now. So between March and October, that's the um, time when the, um, when the agencies are really putting their budgets together. And then they, they give their budgets to the governor. And between November and February, the governor puts his budget together. So he accepts a number of the agency recommendations and other, one, other, other recommendations he does not accept. Um, on February 15th, by February 15th, the governor has to be ready to present his budget, his or her budget to the um, House Finance Committee. So I think uh, most you're usually there are usually a lot of people around when the governor comes to finance with the budget, and he does his presentation, gives us the budget, the governor's budget, and from there the House Finance Committee works on the budget. In during the House phase, we have three we have three divisions. And the divisions are Division One works on the general, general government, um, justice, environment, um, just and a lot of the small agencies. I think actually Phil had a had a um, slide in here that um, talked about talked about some of the uh, different different agencies. And um, that's Division One does most of the work on the smaller agencies. They do um, um, safety, uh, protection. They do uh, um, all the, the prisons and, um, municip and municipal aid kinds of things. Um, Division Two works on the education budget. And that's everything, all of the budget for um, public schools charter schools, the university system, community college system. 
So they, um, they work on that and included in their division is also the transportation budget. So um, they have a pretty good slice. And then division three does the health and human services budget, which ends up to be about 45, 40, 45% of the entire state budget. And um, they present um, the budget. So each of these divisions is working on their sections of the budget. And they make recommendations back to the full committee. And then the full committee brings forth and puts together and brings forth um, the budget, which we bring which we present then to the House and the House, um, the House votes on the budget. And we are working both on House Bill 1, which is actually, if you open it up, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of numbers, but also imp more importantly, actually sometimes is House Bill 2, which is a lot of the policy that goes along with House Bill 1. Really, without House Bill 2, House Bill 1 wouldn't work very well because um, they go hand in hand, but that the policy in House Bill 2 is very important. During the House phase, we will be having public hearings. Um, it's very important that uh, people let us know their feelings about the budget, what they, where they see gaps, where they see um, areas of concern, and we would have we'll have two or three or maybe more actually, if, if this Zoom thing works out, we might be able to have more public hearings actually than when we, um, in recent years, we've been traveling and had a couple of um, away from Concord public hearings. So I think um, actually with this technology, we may be able to have more public input than we have in the past. Um, and then after the house, passes the uh, budget, hopefully they, they will, will pass the budget in recent years. Uh, we actually had a budget a few years ago that the House, it, it could not get out of the House. So um, that was, a, that was a, budget, a budget dilemma that um, we had a, 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 lot of, a lot of difficulties around that, that particular year. But in, in more recent years, the budgets have passed the House and they move on then to the Senate. And um, the Senate um, does the same sort of thing. They are not as, um, they do not work by division. There's uh, a finance committee in the Senate made up of, of maybe seven or eight people. Um, it's a smaller group of people working together and um, they work on the, the budget usually as a whole and not at, not as um, not as divisions like the, um, like the House Finance Committee. Once the uh, Senate has crafted their budget, they've changed they've made changes to the House budget either they've added or they've taken away or um, whatever whatever it is that they've decided to do, then um, they need to pass it through this entire Senate. And then from there, depending on how the House feels about it, we either, we either ask for a committee of conference or we agree with them on the budget. Um, it's most, most, in most in years, in most bienniums, we have had a committee of conference where the two bodies, the House and the Senate, get together and try to work out a compromise and a budget that we can, both the House and Senate can support, and then we can send it on to the governor. And we did that in this, the biennium that we're in right now, as people probably remember, uh, a year ago, June, we had a committee of conference, the House and the Senate, we met together. We came together around a budget that we could support. Both the House and Senate passed that budget. We sent it on to the governor. And then if you remember, um, he vetoed it. And um, once he vetoed it, 
it took us until September to work out a compromise with him that we could pass through the House and Senate, but then also have him um, agree to. So um, this biennium is a is it got kind of got off got off to a rocky start because um, it meant that during the um, during that period from July first to we to September when sep late September when we finally um, passed the budget, it means that the departments were um, basically the spending was frozen at the level of the previous budget. <clears throat> so a lot of things that we had in our budget that were new programs, um, new initiatives, those did not get started until fall. And then of course, um, many of those had barely gotten started when we got um, hit with the uh, COVID crisis. So um, that sort of outlines the, um, the budget, the process. And I think um, there are a number of places in the process that advocates can certainly um, weigh in. And um, I think I can speak for at least the House Finance Committee. I think that we really, we really welcome the input that we get from the public. Um, we learn a lot from the public when they, they come to comment about the budget. and. Um, I think that New Hampshire is very unique in that we have this very large house, very large legislature, and we have a lot of public, a lot of public interaction. People really, people really do um, know what's going on with their constituents and in their communities. So um, keep coming to the legislature. I'm hoping that we are, I'm hoping we'll be back up and running and um, we'll see many of you down there this, this um, next spring when we're working on the budget. And I guess probably the, there are a lot of, I'm sure there might be, there are probably a lot of questions out there, but I will just say a few words because I think this is what's on everybody's mind um, about um, the revenue shortfalls. Everybody's, Everybody's estimating, everyone's guessing, there's all sorts of things going on. But at this point, our 2020 um, revenues, which um, ended on July 1st, ended on June 30th, um, our reports are at this point unaudited. Um, so there's still a lot of information to come. We're still receiving information. I think Phil spoke briefly in his presentation that the July numbers um, were actually above plan. But most of that is because it's probably really, a, really 2020 money that came in after July 1st. So a lot of that, those kind of things need to really get worked out for us to have a clear picture of where we are, where we are. When we close the books on June 30th, um, I think the last, I think what the, um, what the monthly revenue focus showed was that we were about $143 million short. And like I said, people anticipate that as the biennium goes on, we may reach as much as um, 400 million. So what will we do about all of that? Well, um, I think there's a lot of people thinking about it. Um, it's going to be one of the biggest challenges the legislature is going to face when we go back, when we get back in there in January. Um, there are a lot of moving parts. There were, are probably a lot of lapses that have not been accounted for at this point, spending lapses that have not been a, a, accounted for at this point. We know the governor has already started um, having departments not spending at the level of the appropriations. Uh, we've had a hiring freeze. Um, obvious, 
needless to say, there's been a travel freeze. So there's been um, a slowdown of spending. Phil mentioned that we have $115 million in the rainy day fund. Um, I'm sure there will be debate about how to use that if we use any portion of it to meet the uh, shortfall. Uh, the rainy day fund, it's taken us a long time to build it up to that 115. So there will, I'm sure, be a lot of debate about how much we, will, uh, we would use from the rainy day fund. Um, I keep, I'm sort of optimistic. I keep hoping that um, the federal government will come through with um, some help for the states. It's not just New Hampshire, it's all states that are having revenue shortfalls because of coronavirus. And um, they've, this, the, Fed, the federal government has um, sent lots of money to the states to address um, the coronavirus shortfalls in businesses, um, services, Lots of, there's been a lot of real, in, lots of money that's come into the states, but they have not allowed it to be used for, for the state shortfalls. But hopefully, I'm still hoping that in the future, we will see um, the federal government allow some, some funding, some federal funding to help with um, revenue shortfalls. I would say to you that this is a place where advocacy will help. Our delegation understands, certainly I've talked with um, Governor she um, Senator Shaheen's office and um, Senator Hassan's office. I've spoken with um, uh, Pat, uh, Chris Pappas and um, Annie Custer. They all understand how important it is I can tell you that um, certainly Senator Shaheen and Senator Hassan, having been governor, understand how important it is that um, the state is going, the state is going to need some assistance. So our delegation is actually, um, I think, in very knowledgeable about the issue and would definitely go for, go for um, a plan that would include um, federal funds for, for the uh, revenue shortfall for the state. But um, there are others in Congress and the Senate that are not as um, supportive. So um, any, any kind of advocacy anyone can do around that, I don't think it's a bad idea to keep reminding our delegation that this is very important to the state of New Hampshire. If we don't see something, um, the chances are we will see some very deep cuts in our in our budget. So um, let's hope that we can get some some at least some help from from the federal government. Um, I did see in the chat. I haven't been watching it too closely, but I did see in the chat someone wanted to know about how much money was left in the CARES fund, and um, New Hampshire received. 1.25 billion dollars and that's a lot of money in new hampshire 1.25 billion dollars um, for covid related um, activities things in new hampshire and we right now have about a billion dollars that has been allocated it has not all gone out at this point um, and if you go on um, the Gopher website, you can find um, a listing of how all of that money has been allocated. And um, as you probably, many of you know, 400 million of it was allocated to businesses for businesses to apply to help with their shortfalls. There was a nonprofit fund a n number of different areas, a health care fund. So I ask you a question about that, Mary Jane. This yes. Is, um, is the governor seeking much um, diverse input on how those dollars are spent? Or does he continue to go to kind of favorite people and sources? Uh, 
You know, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. The, um, the Legislative Oversight Committee has been meeting. Um, we have had many, many presentations. And um, on the whole, we have, and we have made a lot of recommendations. And on the whole, the governor and the legislative oversight have been, I'd say, 75% of the time in agreement about the funding, about the different funds. Um, there have been a few things that the governor has done that uh, were not recommend, the, um, the uh, legislative oversight committee did uh, had not recommended. It wasn't that we might not have recommended it, but we had we did not um, they were not on our on our uh, agenda um, who advises him outside of the legislative oversight i i'm not sure i'm sure that um he gets a lot of, he, i'm sure that he gets a lot of people um contacting him about the um about those funds i mean there has been a lot a huge amount of interest in those funds sure. Yeah. Another big picture question. What happened to the revenue surpluses of the last two years? They were used in the budget that we are, are presently in. So okay. like, it, like when you think about the large increase in education funding, mm -hmm. the additional funding for the university system, um, a lot of that, I mean, that the budget surplus was used in the last budget to do to provide a lot of that. And maybe Phil wants to remark about that too. So I mean, as with uh, what may be the case, if we're carrying forward a deficit into the next budget by ADM, when you carry forward a surplus in the next budget by ADM, that means that you know you yeah. can deploy a surplus. If we're talking about a deficit into the next by ADM, you have to reconcile the deficit in the right. two-year plan. So yeah. Um, so the the surplus is uh, is and it was in the last budget and the budget before. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, although I'll say in both cases, uh, some amount was put into the rainy day fund, um, but uh, but by and large, it was used as as revenue was um, that mm -hmm. was collected during the state budget by any. Yeah. Okay. A few more more detailed questions for you, Phil. Um, one person wasn't able to see the rooms and meals uh, percentage, and also a person had a question about where do cooperatives fit in on um, the taxing and and that. Uh, graph that you shared. Yeah, so um, the the rooms and meals percentage um, is uh, uh, is in terms of the tax rate is nine percent. It was raised from eight percent um, between fiscals uh, 20, uh, 2009 and twenty ten, I believe. Um, and the percentage down that it is relative to the prior year, there were actually two lines on that graph. One is from the uh, exact prior month, and one was a three month rolling average. Um, I think our worst month, uh, if I recall, was May, which was reflecting April economic activity, and that was about, uh, I think it was a little over 50% down, so only half the revenue that was collected in that April, or last April, was uh, uh, relative to the April before. Um, and uh, I don't know yet what it is this, uh, this month, uh, we don't have the final numbers yet, but in uh, July revenues, it was about 30% down, if I recall. No, you, from you had a pie chart, where it I was believe. Last July. Sorry. Oh, you... the pie chart, um, it was, you know, that's no problem. Um, it was uh, the pie chart as a percentage of the general and education trust fund revenues overall. Mm -hmm. uh, the meals and rentals tax was about 13%, I think 13.2. Um, and uh, and in terms of cooperatives, you're talking about uh, business cooperatives. Um, at my, I wouldn't I wouldn't profit that matters. It also matters where it is relative to the filing threshold in terms of revenue that comes in, because both the business profits and business enterprise taxes have filing thresholds. Um, so with a cooperative, it would really it would really depend on the individual entity. And I'm I'm not a tax attorney, so I can't tell you. Uh, but um, uh, but it really it does the, um, uh, if it's a nonprofit then uh, uh, then in if it's right. a five hundred one c three nonprofit I should say then it wouldn't be taxed 
Um, so that's the uh, that's the sort of the upshot there relative to cooperatives, as far as I'm aware. Okay, thank you. Um, there's also a question about um, the tax cuts that occurred in 2016. What companies were impacted by those, and how much revenue was lost? And was this made up um, by increased jobs? Do we have any way of knowing that? I, so I, I really couldn't um, speak to that detail. The, that would really. Uh, the jobs question is. Go ahead. Go, Go ahead, on. Phil. Go, Phil. No, no, no sorry. I, I, I think my internet connection is a little fuzzy, so I apologize for that. I will, um, I'll stop my video and that will maybe make it smoother. Uh, the, the, so there's been a series of business tax, uh, business tax rate reductions. Um, 2016 was the first round. Um, there was another round in 2018 and 2019 um, and one, but that does not appear to be happening um, because of a revenue trigger. Uh, so the, um, uh, the, the, total amount that um, was foregone in terms of foregone revenue. Um, I'm not sure what the total amount was uh, in total, but the, uh, in, this, uh, legislative, uh, in this legislative session, this last uh, budget, the increment um, in terms of reduction was actually smaller in terms of the business profits tax rate and the business enterprise tax rate reduction was larger. Um, but the estimate was that it was about, um, the, de the decision was around a $90 million difference in terms of budgeting. Um, I believe it was $91 million in terms of whether that tax rate reduction occurred or not in this last budget cycle. Um, in terms of aggregate from the 2016, just those 2016 changes, I'm not sure. Um, but I can tell you that uh, if you, uh, there is little evidence, um, there is no, no evidence that I've been able to detect, and we at NHFPI have studied it, uh, that the business tax rate reductions that we've seen have increased tax revenue. It does not appear to be the case. It appears that the business tax rate reductions that we've seen have decreased revenue to the state. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a, in May, we published a, um, a paper around funding the state budget. We published an issue brief in May of 2019, I should say, um, that did examine this issue in detail and tried to look at timing and try and really understand what the effects of those business tax rate reductions were, um, both on the economy and on, um, on state revenue. And we did not see any increase in state revenue that could be tied to business tax rate reductions. So there were decreases in revenue and not increases. Um, so my apologies, I hope, that, I hope that audio was smoother there and I know Representative Walner had something else to say. No, I think, I think you covered it very well, Phil, thank you. And, and as far as knowing exactly what companies benefited and didn't, I don't think we have that level of detail. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll say relative to individual taxpayers, the State Department of Revenue Administration um, uh, does not provide that information. They generally, um, when you get to less than 10 taxpayers, they de uh, generally anonymize things. And, and uh, um, so, so we, don't, we don't know in particular. Um, we know that uh, the business profits tax base, for example, as I, as I outlined in the slide deck, is largely incident on generally high profit and often uh, multi-state and multinational companies. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're kind of reaching the bewitching hour. There are a few more comments in the chat, and I would encourage anybody who has more questions to reach out to Mary Jane or Phil on your own. Um, can, I, can I just get Mary Jane to add, answer Catherine's question? She's a first time candidate about what the ideal background for finance committee members is, because you've got just, an eager, e eager beaver that wants to work <laughs> in your committee. That's great. Um, I know. I just looked at that question. I just opened the chat. I was just looking at the chat. And, um, you know, I, the finance committee is made up of people from all walks of life. I mean, truly, I mean, I was, a, I was the director of a child care agency, um, but we have also uh, someone who was a judge. We have some bankers. We have two CPAs. We have a lot of teachers. Um, it is just a really wide variety of people from all walks of life. And um, when new representatives come to the house, they um, fill out a card telling us what they, what their preferred, what their first, second, and third choices are for committees, usually on finance, 
um, people who are serving for their first term do not usually come on finance. Usually it's people who've, who've had a term or two who um, come onto the finance committee. And, um, but it really, it's, it's people, everyone comes with a different, from different walks of life. And that's what makes it really interesting. And um, people have a lot, you know, they have a lot of expertise and love, most of them really love putting the budget together. Well, and you must as well, because you've got about 30 years of doing it, right? <laughs> I've been there a little while. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much to our presenters. We appreciate all of your time and efforts in sharing with us. And as you can see in the chat, there is another program on Thursday. Uh, I believe it's criminal justice. Is that right, Rob? No, no, it's health care on Thursday. Um, okay with Lucy Weber and Mike Padmore. Okay, great. All right, thanks everyone, and have a good evening. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. everybody. Bye. Bye, Rob. Thanks. Bye-bye.